Hello, hello. Welcome back to the podcast. This is the Other States of America History Podcast. I am Eric Giannis, just in case you don't know. In our first episode on New Sweden, we covered the amazing story of Peter Minuet and his, what I would call, revenge plot. Having been fired from New Netherland as their director, he shows up a little bit later in the southern part of the colony, takes a huge bite out of it, and names it New Sweden for the Swedish crown, of course. Very similar to the life of Henry Hudson and his career moves. And just like Henry Hudson, the ending is somewhat mysterious. Henry Hudson, of course, was the victim of a mutiny, and he, some supporters, and his son were left in a little boat, and that is the last they were ever seen or heard from. Peter Minuet, similarly, was on a boat, a storm came through, and the boat was never seen again. So after all this careful planning, and the one in a million Hail Mary shot at taking a bite out of New Netherland succeeded, the genius behind it, Peter Minuet, is gone from history. So now New Sweden has to find its way on its own. Peter Minuet, on his way out of the colony, put a man by the name of Mons Kling in charge. And this guy was to keep order until Peter Minuet returned. And of course, that wasn't going to happen. So the people of New Sweden were awfully surprised in April of 1640 when Minuet didn't show up again, but rather a totally different person. When the ship Minuet used to found the colony, the Kalmar Nickel, returned, it had a new guy in charge of it. His name was Peter Hollander Ritter. Now, the middle name Hollander gives away that his family, or at least his father's side of the family, was originally from the Netherlands. So this man was Dutch, or very close to Dutch. Maybe a low German descent. We don't exactly know. But he had a solid allegiance towards Sweden, and he was an officer in the Swedish Navy. So he was a very capable person for this position. Unlike his counterpart in New Netherland at this time, if you go back to our New Netherland episode, who, of course, was Willem Kieft. Reports say that when he arrived in New Sweden, everyone who had been left there two years previously had survived. This is pretty rare for any beginning colony. Usually there's a mass die-off event. In the northern latitudes, it's during the winter, of course, when the food runs out or gets low and it gets cold and everything else you could imagine in that case. And in the more southerly latitudes, it's usually the summer. So in colonial Virginia, in Jamestown, 1607, 1608, 1609, massive die-off in the summer when the weather is really hot and the work is very strenuous and you have a population of people from, let's say, England, which has much colder weather than Virginia. So the people who set up New Sweden, they were a tough crowd and many of them actually decided to go home after that two-year period. We don't know the exact percentage because there had been no census numbers during this time. They, had, they don't have an official count that exists in the records today. So I can't tell you around 1640 exactly how many people were in the colony. It, but it's definitely less than 300. And a huge chunk of them said, after two years, I did my job. I'm going home. Which is understandable. They did their job. They probably have a, a nice big fat payday when they get back home. And usually this first wave of colonization is typically almost completely men. So, a bunch of guys alone in the wilderness for two years. A good number of them is going to want to find a bunch of women when they get back home. Ritter brought with him family members of various colonists, presumably to stay there. He also brought livestock and other trade goods for the Native Americans, of course. New colonists were really hard to find, so they came over in small numbers, especially considering how few ships actually visited New Sweden in its, over the course of its entire existence, which comes out to be like less than a dozen official ships from the Sweden South Company. Sweden didn't have as many push factors, as historians call them, as England did, for instance, to make people emigrate out of a country and immigrate to a new area. So for England at this time, you have some religious conflicts, which is causing the Puritans to come pouring over into New England especially. You also have a large amount of people who are moving to the southern English colonies to make a ton of money on cash crops growing tobacco. English fathers tend to give all of their property by tradition to their oldest son to run their estate, so to speak. So you have a bunch of what is called second sons, a bunch of people who uh, grew up with some education, with some money, but they didn't inherit any of it. So they have to go out and make their own fortune. So that's another reason why you see a huge wave of English men come over. Sweden doesn't have this problem. England actually is getting overcrowded. There actually there's the uh, enclosure movement, which is pushing people out of the farms into cities or onto boats to new lands altogether. Sweden doesn't have this problem. Sweden has a lot of territory. It is cold, 
but it's nearly uninhabited by today's terms. We talked about Sweden have a popu- having a population of 1 to 1.2 million people in its entire empire at this time, which was much larger than the nation of Sweden today. So there's plenty of room. They don't have the same social problems that England has. And so who's moving to this colony? Who are they getting? So they are getting some volunteers. And we'll see they get some disgraced military officials at times. And sometimes they get criminals. Or what the Swedish crown would consider criminals at that time. In the last episode, we also mentioned that there would be drift fins or forest fins. So the Finnish ethnic group, which was yet to have a national identity of its own, was just a small minority inside of the Swedish Empire. And the Swedes were eager to deport a lot of these people out of the Swedish Empire. They weren't very tolerant towards them. The one thing about the Finns that are always noted in terms of what the Swedish did not like about them at the time was their practice of slash and burn agriculture. So this involves burning a large chunk of forest or grassland in order to clear the land, one, and the ash from all that f- that burnt up organic material then helps to fertilize the soil. Now, there was a population of Finnish people who were living inside of Sweden proper, and they would live in the forest. They were called forest fins or drift fins, and they would practice this slash and burn agriculture. And as you can imagine, a population of people starting forest fires might be annoying to the majority group, the Swedes. So that was the main given reason for their wanting to be depopulated from the Swedish Empire. So some authors in the past have characterized New Sweden as a penal colony. But it's that, that isn't quite the case. There are a lot of people there who are there quite willingly. There just so happens to be a small population that isn't there willingly. So Ritter, as leader of the colony, it seems like he had a lot of obstacles in his way, a lot of different factions to deal with. But remember, the population is really small. So it's not quite as hard of a job as the director of New Netherland will be going through, especially Kieft and his successor, Stuyvesant, both of which we'll get to in this episode. A perfect example of how New Sweden was far easier to run than New Netherland is that around 1642, we have Ritter and Kieft. They're the leaders of their respective colonies, and the English have settled on the Delaware. A group have come from New Haven. They have settled in Delaware. They're not quite built up yet, and we're in this critical decision time. For the Swedes, this is easy. Get rid of them. Remove them. But for the Dutch, and for New Netherland in general, they're from the colony right to the other side of you. And they're in league with all the other New England colonies. And so for the Swedes, let's get rid of them. But for the Dutch, it's a more diplomatic situation. It's, it's, it's a little more convoluted. Let's say we remove them, but we're a little too harsh. We're a little too violent in some way. Well, there could be reprisals from the colonies that are right next to us. It's, it, it could happen. It's, it's conceivable. And at this time, the population of New England outnumbers New Netherland. I, I don't know. I would say she's, their numbers are dwindling. Uh, it could be as much as 60 to 1. And so for New Netherland, it was a delicate situation. Whereas for New Sweden, it was an obvious situation. We're just a little colony on the Delaware. Let's get rid of these people. So Kieft and Ritter collectively, in some way, we don't have the exact records, but the two powers collectively removed the English, at least the ones involved in the fur trade. And there was a small remnant left over. Now we see this with Kieft, who we covered in our New Netherland episode. We know he's incompetent. We know he's a coward. We see that the Swedes are able to woo him in certain ways. They open a letter-writing relationship. Ritter actually gets along with Kieft quite well and Ritter's success, uh, successor even more so. But as New Sweden makes itself more visible and becomes more of a nuisance to New Netherland, uh, things are starting to fray a little bit. For example, Ritter would just sail his sloop right past Fort Nassau, challenging their command of the river. And Fort Nassau, they'd shoot cannons off over his head, kind of like warning shots. But what Ritter would do by doing that is to establish, hey, you don't have control of this river. You don't have control over me. I've won this game of chicken. Now, had Fort Nassau decided to attack Ritter directly, well, that's kind of an act of war. Now, would New Netherland be able to support that war? Furthermore, what would that do with Swedish and Dutch relations back at home? So, Ritter deduced correctly that whoever was in command of the fort was not about to start a full-scale engagement over him going up and down a river in his little sloop. Very smart man. Adding to this, Keith writes back home to the West India Company that the Swedish on the Delaware had completely ruined the trade through that vein, through that artery, Fort Nassau. 
It's ruined. The Swedes swallowed it all up. They have better deals. Their forts are closer to the supply. It's over. But then around this time, it becomes apparent that the Swedish South Company has a lot of Dutch investors, including a lot of investors in the Dutch West India Company. It's, it's definitely a conflict of interest. And there weren't set in stone rules about those sorts of things back then as there would be today. But by 1641, the Dutch investors started to sell off their interests, including Blomert. They're very much like, okay, all right, this, this isn't all right. I'm sorry. I, I shouldn't have done this. And so they began selling off all the shares they have in this company. New Sweden grew to be basically an unsanctioned spinoff of New Netherland. A lot of the same investors, again, Peter Minuet, a lot of the same people right there on the ground. It reminds me a lot of, if you've ever seen that movie Coming to America with Eddie Murphy, the, uh, the love interest, her father owns a restaurant called McDowell's, which is a knockoff of McDonald's. But of course, it's going to eat up the business in that area who are looking for cheap, fast hamburgers. New Sweden, very similarly, takes the entire business model of the early Dutch West India Company, applies it to the Delaware instead of primarily the Hudson, and they eat up all the business. So the Dutch are going to more or less be shamed out of their investment in the New Sweden Company. But the investment of the Swedish government and people high-ranking in the Swedish government in the company will continue. And so New Sweden will continue to be of interest to Sweden particularly, until events turn it away later on in our story. This would include Admiral Fleming, very powerful uh, leader of the Navy at the time of the Swedish Empire. Now, what this meant is that the government and the business were intricately connected, meaning if the government needed some of New Sweden's uh, ships that belonged to the company, they would just take them. And vice versa, if the company needed something and the Navy could help facilitate that, well, the Navy would simply be drafted to help out the company. Of course, because of the head of the Navy, <laughs> he would benefit politically from helping the Navy. And then on the other side of things, he would benefit financially by having the Navy help his own company. So, again, there are no set in uh, stone rules here. Business and government, they're in together. It's a very open thing. It's, a, it's, it's not free market capitalism by any stretch of the imagination. But Ritter, whose only real adversary was Kieft, serves his three-year term, and he returns to Sweden successfully. Goes on to have a great career as a local governor, has a good life. But now New Sweden needs a new governor. Who are we going to find? The Swedes find this guy, Johan Prince. Prince originally wanted to be a minister, and when he was in school to be a minister, he was essentially drafted. It's what they called being pressed into service. And after he was drafted, he kind of had a change of heart and he liked war he liked the strategy he liked the power and he became a mercenary for a while before he joined the ranks of the swedish military he served in the 30 years war made quite a name for himself but in one engagement he actually abandoned a fort and as you can imagine this brought a little disgrace upon himself he is demoted for this but later right before he becomes the governor of new sweden he is made nobility he is knighted and then send on his way to New Sweden. New Sweden, as we mentioned, is sometimes the location for prisoners or other sorts of people who need to make amends with Sweden proper by going away for a while. Maybe Prince was knighted as a sort of going away present, but sent to New Sweden to kind of prove himself again. I'm not sure, the records don't exactly tell the story, but you can kind of fish out the details from that because being in charge of New Sweden wasn't exactly something on your checklist of things you wanted to do if you were among Swedish nobility at the time. And just like Ritter, Prince was promised he's three years. He says, Prince said, okay, I get to come home in three years, right? And they said, yes, three years. You're only going to be there three years. We'll send somebody to relieve you. And in fact, one of the first things he says when he gets to New Sweden is, I'm only here for three years. By that time, he was a seasoned military man, 50 years of age. And he came with his wife and five daughters. Now, bringing a, a bunch of young women to a colony that's mostly full of starved frontiersmen is not the best scenario to put yourself in. But Prince will not be the type of pushover you'll see from Willem Kieft in New Netherland. He is described as having spooky blue eyes. Literally, the sources say spooky, icy blue eyes and an overbite. But his most striking feature is the fact that he weighed about 400 pounds. So we can estimate all day the, his exact weight. But sources say around 400 pounds. The natives in the area, they called him in their own languages, large stomach. That's how they knew him. And once when FDR was in Delaware, he very famously repeated the proverb, 
No governor of Delaware before or since has weighed as much as Johann Prince. Now, I don't know if that's a proverb or just a limerick. I'm going to call it a limerick. And this begs the question in my mind, and, and no one else's for some reason, but my mind sometimes works a little differently than the rest of the world. Was he the fattest man in the world at that time? Would he have had the Guinness Book of World Records at that time for being the world's fattest man? I don't think so. 400 pounds, I don't think, would have done it. But was he the fattest man in the Atlantic colonies at this time? Maybe. Was he the fattest man on the North American continent at this time? Possibly. I've done a little bit of searching, and I can't find a fatter person. Not in North America, anyway. So this begs the question, is he the fattest man in the Americas at this time? Again, maybe. I'm not going to say probably, I'm going to say maybe. So this guy right here, Johann Prince, very capable, member of nobility, interesting fella. He might also be the fattest man in the Americas. And I'm just going to leave it at that. He and his family, when they arrive in New Sweden, live in Fort Christina. Now, very quickly after this point, he decides he wants to make an estate of his own. And he chooses an island in the middle of the Delaware River. Now, why did he want to do this? C.A. Westlager, and I believe I said his name right this time, believes that, he wrote in one of his books, there's, there's a couple, and I'm forgetting which one specifically, that maybe having five girls in this colony dominated by desperate men, it was good to live on an island. <laughs> so he decides to set up an estate on this island, and he calls it Princehof. It's actually a really good location to set up headquarters because from his, his residential household, he could essentially control this very narrow part of the river as he's on an island in the middle of it. In addition to his own household, he sought to build new forts on both sides of the river. The dream, of course, would be eventually there'd be enough manpower there and boats to command absolute control over everything going in and out of that riverway. Of course, he has to contend with the Dutch this whole time. Now, it doesn't matter that he's in front of all of the trade and getting all the beaver pelts. If somehow the Dutch are able to stop his boats from coming in and out, confiscating his goods, or at least putting a tax or tariff on them of some sort, it doesn't matter that you, you had first access to the first. You still have to pay the Dutch to get your way out. So the dream, in the end of the day, is to control the entire riverway. In the first year that Prince took over the colony, 20 men died of various ailments, I imagine. It doesn't say exactly in the sources what they died of, but 20 men died of the estimated 90 men in the colony. That's a large portion. That's, well, that's more than 20%, isn't it? So New Sweden, in its entire existence, is always going to be hungry for more people. Of course, fur trading requires very few people, especially when the Native Americans are doing all the work, and then your people simply have to exchange the furs for goods. But there were other industries that the uh, Swedish Crown and the Swedish South Company wanted to see developed in New Sweden. Tobacco was one they were trying to work on. We, we talked about that way back with Minuet, because he had a license to all the tobacco coming into Sweden, which of course is now up in the air and gone, and probably reverting back to the Swedish South Company itself. But Prince had orders to look around for mineral goods, very similar to the early orders of the explorers of New Netherland. For the Spanish especially, the Americas were full of gold and silver in amazing amounts. Unfortunately for the Swedes and the Dutch and the English, the parts that they were occupying, not so much. Of course, they didn't know that at this time. Prince was also ordered to try out different livestock in the area, see, see what worked. By this time, pigs had actually gone feral in New Sweden, and as pigs will basically anywhere else on Earth other than the Arctic. And so a feral pig population changes the environment a little bit, but it's a, it's a new f source of food for Native Americans, and the colonists, without having to pen and take care of these animals, could also hunt wild pigs. They also wanted to try other livestock, and believe it or not, Prince was ordered to try making silk which the Swedish had little idea on how to do that, and Prince himself had no idea how to do that. So that, that never panned out. As for the fur trade specifically, it remained a company monopoly. Unlike New Netherland that just kind of opened everything up, which caused a lot of people to come to the colony, New Sweden kept everything locked down. If fur is going to be traded in New Sweden territory, it goes to the company. And believe it or not, most of those furs are actually going to be sold in the Netherlands. It's where they have the best hat makers in the world at the time. So once again, we see that the new Sweden company is a unofficial spinoff of the Dutch West India Company. They're doing the same business. They're selling to the same people. The model is, is identical. <laughs> the Sweden South Company 
also made Lutheranism the official religion of the colony, because Sweden at this time is officially Lutheran. Now, this did not apply to the Dutch colonists that happened to be in the area. They were allowed to worship openly whatever they wanted to. Compare this to New Netherland, who we often think as being this super tolerant place. Officially, they were Dutch Reform, which is a form of Calvinism. And open worship in other forms were certainly not allowed at this time. But they did happen in secret, and that was tolerated. But New Sweden actually ends up being a little more modern in, in our secular sense. Now, Prince himself made it very clear that he was the law of the land. This is not an English colony that has town halls or a, a distant governor on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean or some, some crazy thing like that. This is a Swedish colony, and Johann Prince is Swedish nobility. He is the law. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. He makes that very clear. And so he tends to do things without ever getting approval from the forces that be back home because he's part of the nobility. It is his right to make certain decisions. And that includes all the way up to capital punishment. That's all within his jurisdiction as far as he's concerned. He is not a man of the people. He is the government in total. We're talking about uh, trading with foreign powers. We're talking about just local law enforcement, any sort of taxation system set up, maintenance, uh, the duty of the company employees. It's all him. He is the sole power, and he's able to do this successfully because the colony is very small in number. Let's compare this to Keefe over in New Netherland, when the colony bloats up to 3,000 people before he ruins everything. He also kind of wants to be the sole power in the colony. But A, he's a coward, and B, there's just too many people to do that. So Prince is dealing with maybe 300 people. So it's a lot easier to throw your weight around, especially at a time when your nobility and people really respected nobility at that time. So the Swedes and the Finns would have understood that he was in a higher class and should be listened to. Our man Kieft in New Netherland, he had no known claim to nobility, although when he showed up, he uh, basically equated himself to the Prince of Orange. And I, the people immediately went, oh, I, I don't think so. One example of Johann Prince laying down his own law as far as external trade is concerned is that he would let ships from Virginia and the southern colonies trade with the Swedes. They had access to all sorts of goods that were rarely coming from Sweden. And the southern English uh, colonies were not looking to export people to the Delaware River to such an extent that the New England colonies were. So he made the judgment call of, you know what, I'm trading with the people from Virginia. If they come to, if they come to the bay, they want to trade with us, we're going to trade with them. And of course, the English government at this time are mercantilist, which is a modern name for the policy of colonialism at the time, predating capitalism, where you wanted to kind of keep all your resources in your country so you would have the strength to fight other countries if need be. So eventually they pass a bunch of navigation acts that apply to the Swedes and to the Dutch and all other foreign powers, basically, because the English, they can see that their resources are leaking out. Now, today we realize that trading with other countries is mostly a good thing. But back then, countries were about stockpiling resources. Johann Prince's immediate external threat was, of course, the Dutch. So once trade was opened up in 1639, we have a flood of people coming in before Keefe ruins everything with his needless wars. And there are Dutch people settling along the Delaware, along with the English. So in addition to removing the English, Johann Prince goes very quickly into removing the Dutch or getting them to pledge an allegiance to the Swedish crown. He has some success with this. And then he also goes through the Swedish maps and he erases place names, anything that's Dutch sounding, anything that would suggest that the Dutch were there first or settled there first. He starts getting rid of these things from the official Swedish maps, Swedish records, or the records of anything he had access to. So he's whitewashing the past to erase any Dutch fingerprint and replace it with Swedish. And even though he's the new guy on the block and he has a tenth of the population of the Dutch, the, new, uh, the colony of New Netherland, he's quite successful because he's just, he, he charms Willem Kieft, the guy who's supposed to be his rival. He manages to sweet talk him at every single turn. They actually met at least once. And Keefe said that they shared a unity and good friendship. Keefe was fully convinced that this guy Prince was his friend. Now, Keefe himself, who was very unpopular, might have just liked the fact that somebody liked him. And Keefe also might have been sort of charmed by the fact that this guy was an ex-military guy and he was 
part of Swedish nobility. He's a, a guy you'd want to be friendly towards in general, even though he's working for a separate power. But it, however it got done, Johan Prince, possibly the largest man in the Americas, was a bit of a charmer to Keith, and Keith really liked communicating with him. And this probably allowed Johan Prince to do basically whatever he wanted to the Dutch in the Delaware. This relationship became particularly helpful for Johan Prince because just in a couple years, Sweden is involved in a lot of wars, and Johan Prince planned on being there three years, but after two years or so, I have the exact figure written down somewhere, I'll dig it up, he stops receiving communications from Sweden. So Prince is essentially cut off from the entire rest of the world after being there 24 months or so, the line goes silent. His only contact with the outside world is through Kieft, who is still receiving information and news from Europe. So they exchange uh, quite a few letters, and Kieft is his main source of information about the outside world. Now, if Kieft was a smarter man, he might have used this knowledge to shade Johann Prince's view of the world in such a way as to benefit his colony, New Netherland. But there's no evidence he did that. He seems fully convinced that this guy is his friend. Johan Prince even somehow manages to purchase livestock from New Amsterdam. Livestock was a precious commodity during this period in time. And there's a lot of controversy in New Netherland about who gets the livestock, what happened to the company livestock, how did it end up on this guy's private farm. Some of the rare livestock they had ended up in a whole nother competing colony. This Johan Prince guy must have been quite a charmer. Let's move on to how Johann Prince dealt with the Native Americans. That relationship was probably more important than the colony's relationship to New Netherland. So generally, they had very good relations with the Native Americans. The fur trade depended completely on maintaining that relationship. And also, New Sweden was always very small in number, so space never became an issue. They were never so close together as to, to annoy one another. One of the parting orders that Prince got as he left Sweden, was to find a couple local natives who would be willing to go back to Sweden so that the scientists there, if you can call them scientists in the 17th century, could study them, learn about them. Um, it's, it's unclear whether they were going to study them from an anthropological point of view. You know, uh, who are you? What are you about? What do you believe? What are your views on the world? Or from a scientific point of view, like they were an animal specimen. But either way, he went to a local sachem and he said, I'd like to take some of your people and bring them back to Sweden so our, our people could have a cultural exchange. And the local, local uh, sachem said to him, well, that sounds great. We can do that. But you have to promise to return all of these people alive. Now, Johann Prince knew that is not a, a good guarantee because of the nature of sea travel at the time and the communicable diseases that have been going around. So he said, well, what happens if I don't return all of them perfect and alive? Well, he said, well, then we'll slaughter your entire colony. So the sachem says, I'm going to kill everyone if we get if we don't get every single one of our people back. And so Johann Prince very, very smartly concluded that we will be sending no natives to Sweden. So that deal never went down. But it shows you the power that the local Native Americans held over the colony. So we often think of Europeans coming in and just dominating, taking over, being savage, and uh, being really brutal towards the Native American population. But we're in the 17th century, the 1600s. Things are very different at this time, and most of the power is held by the Native Americans. That's a generalization, but it's generally true, especially before about 1680. The Lutheran minister in the colony at the time, Johann Campanius, I believe is how you pronounce it, he was very interested in the local Lenape tribes and whatnot. He learned their languages and he wrote about them and he, he drew little pictures of them and everything else. He was interested in their culture, but he also had the, the, um, the drive to convert them to Lutheranism. And he figured, much like the Jesuit priests of the North, if I know them, I can figure out a way to convince them that my religion is the correct way. I can, I can convert them to worshiping my God and so save their souls. So in his mind, he had a very real altruistic reason for wanting to convert these natives. And, and he went to the, the typical method that all missionaries are going to use at this time, especially among Native American groups, is that they took the Native American idea of a great spirit. So this spirit that is older than the other spirits, 
higher than the other spirits, more geographically pervasive than the other spirits, and 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 equaled that to basically the Christian God. He said, "Your your great spirit is our Yahweh, or is is our the Father in the uh, Trinity." And so, in this way, introduce a monotheistic religion into a polytheistic religion. This is the thing about polytheistic religions. It can be invaded by new gods from new people coming into different areas. If you believe in many gods, what's one more? They're very easily snuck into a religion, especially if believing in an additional god gives you additional opportunities for trading or just having more contacts, in which case this would. But relations were not 100% perfect between the Swedish colony and the local native population. In June of 1644, there are reports that a husband and wife were murdered, uh, another company worker, and two soldiers over a very short period of time by members of a local Lenape tribe. Johann Prince, he organized a peace conference of sorts before things started to spiral out of control. And the sachem from the tribe that claimed responsibility did compensate for those murders with various trade goods. So this is the reconciliation that would be put into place instead of causing a blood feud, which would, of course, just roll out into an all-out war. Compare this to the previous couple episodes where we were talking about Kieft and how when the same situations happened, these one-off murders, he decided to escalate the scenario, escalate the situation, and cause, well, just probably the most devastating war in the history of New Netherland. But while Johann Prince was good with the Native Americans, trading with them, maintaining relations, he even had parties with them, in his heart of hearts, he thinks they're devil worshippers. So he's, he's recorded as saying they are worshippers of the devil or of demons. This is a common belief at the time. You'll find this in all sorts of Europe, European sources. If you believe in one God, the Christian God, and there are other people out there who believe in spirits that are not aligned with your Christian God, well, those those would be called demons. Again, this makes sense inside of their mindset. I believe the word demon itself comes from the Greek word demonos. So don't quote me on that. It goes something like that. But basically, the word demon is derived from a non-Christian culture's term for their own gods. So foreign gods are demons. And you'll find this even in the Old Testament when the Israelites are talking about the gods of Canaan in the Philistines and other places. So foreign gods are demons. It's not that they don't exist, which would be an argument you would hear today. It's that they do exist and they're demons. After this deal is made and a peace is finalized, Johann Prince said, you know, if this happens again, I'm going to slaughter your entire tribe. So he actually uses the same rhetoric that a sachem used on him uh, two years previously. He uses back on this other sachem. He's a smart man, and he learned what Native American politics entails, and he used their own rhetoric against them in order to maintain a peace. Ultimately, though, Johann Prince wanted to get rid of the Lene Lenape altogether. This, this confederation, medium-sized confederation of Algonquin tribes, stretching from the, the southern portions of what is now New York, all the way through Delaware and whatnot, out to Pennsylvania, just a big old circle in that general area of the United States today. He figured... Uh, he, in his, he wanted to get rid of all of them. He, he wanted a genocidal purge, much like his friend Kieft over in New Netherland. He really did not like the natives who were very close to him. And I have quotes to support this. Johann Prince. Nothing could be better than that we could get some hundreds of soldiers and station them here until we have broken the necks of all the Indians around this river. And then here's another quote, not quite as severe. He was asked at one point the best way to convert Native Americans to Lutheranism. He says, It must be done by force, in that one slaughters and kills the greatest number of the aged, and bring the rest under Her Majesty's command. So in the first quote, he's proposing wiping out entire tribes. And the second quote, he's a little less severe, and he's simply saying we should take out the, the collective history of the people by killing any of the older folks, and by age it, he might just simply mean adult, and then taking the kids or the young adults and re-educating them, so to speak. This is a severe man. This is not a modern person, all right? And I've said this before. If you're looking for modern heroes in the 16th century or 17th century, good luck to you. I'd, I'd, I'd like to see how you go. William Penn, 
That's one that comes to mind. A little after this story. William Penn is about the only character who might make it in today's world as a good person. After this point in time, Sweden gets itself involved in a lot of wars. Especially a lot of northern wars, they're called. And they're going to involve a lot of naval maneuvers. They're going to need ships. And like I said earlier, the company is entangled with the government. At this point, there's a tipping point, And it's now time for the company to help the government and not the other way around. And so the ships that are owned by the company are drafted, so to speak, into Swedish military service. New Sweden is now cut off from the homeland for a great long while. To make matters worse, Admiral Fleming, this link between the Navy and the company, as he's an admiral and a major investor in the company, he dies battling the Danes in 1644. And this would lead to a time after this point where New Sweden is simply forgotten by the higher reaches of the Swedish government for a while. There are other pressing matters, and New Sweden falls by the wayside. Of course, if you remember, Johan Prince was only told he was going to be there three years. Well, this three-year term is running out, and he's not getting any word from Sweden. And so he's just going to keep everything going because he's a good little soldier, but probably in the back of his mind somewhere, he's starting to sweat. He's going, what's going on? Did they forget about me? How can I get a hold of them? Did I do something wrong? Is this to punish me? He starts to feel the pressure of being alone. This lack of communication from the homeland is going to be devastating for the colony because they're, they're not self-sufficient yet. They can't run on their own. New England can run on its own for the most part. The southern colonies, not quite as much, but if you cut them off, they would survive. New Sweden is very small in number. They, at this time, they don't even have a sawmill. So nice wood planks to make houses out of, they have to import. And that's just one example. In November of 1645, their settlement of New Gothenburg was almost completely burned to the ground. The damage was caused by a soldier who fell asleep while a candle was lit. And so in this time when the colony only has a couple hundred people, one of their major settlements just leveled. And there's nobody there to bail them out. They have to rebuild everything themselves. Just a couple months later, in 1646, while the Dutch have just destroyed their relationship with the tribes around New Amsterdam, they began trading with the Susquehanna, who were trading with the Swedish, or Susquehanna. Now, the Native Americans were very smart. Again, the stereotype is that they were often cheated by Europeans. But once there were more than one European power vying for the same commodity, the Native Americans knew they could play both off one another. So now, all of a sudden, the Swedes are giving up so much more for the same amount of fur because they could just turn around and the Natives could sell to the Dutch instead if they didn't get what they wanted. So the trade is starting to be spoiled. And the Swedes aren't getting all sorts of new manufactured goods from Sweden. Again, the flow of goods in is drying up. So they have to begin getting stuff from the Dutch themselves or from the English colonies to the south, who again were rich in cash crops, but not the sort of metal manufactured goods that the Native Americans really wanted. Now the next year, 1647, is a critical year for Johann Prince. This entire time he's been battling wits with a near idiot, Willem Kieft. Well, Kieft is gone during this year, and now he has to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Peter Stuyvesant. And New Netherland will shrink in population to about a thousand people. But as soon as Stuyvesant gets on board, the population starts to boom. Meanwhile, in 1647, I have, I have heard from one source, the population of New Sweden was only 183 people. Now, I've only teased details about Stuyvesant thus far, and he only came in at the end of the episode on Kieft. Something to know about him. He's a military man too, like Johann Prince. He's not somebody to be pushed around easily. Johann Prince seems to have had more experience on the land, whereas Stuyvesant seems to be more of a naval background. But Stuyvesant has more experience in governing, more experience in, in diplomacy, certainly, where Johann Prince probably had more military experience overall. Now, the area they're contesting is the Delaware River. So we have a mixture here of both army and navy. It's a really good matchup. This is the most challenging personality Johann Prince is ever going to deal with. And in fact, right away, Johann Prince realizes, oh, this is a different creature altogether. This isn't Kieft. I can't sweet talk this guy. He's not having it. We're not going to have this beautiful letter writing relationship between us. It's, it's, 
it's going to be different. So Prince has to up his game. And this is when everything kicks into high gear. Now, Prince really doesn't have any advantages over Stuyvesant in terms of resources available to him in order to wage this contest over the Delaware River and the fur trade there. But one strength that Johann Prince probably realized he had over Stuyvesant was the fact that he had a single-minded mission and a single enemy, so to speak. His relations with the natives were stable. His relations with his population, very few in number, were better than that of Stuyvesant, and he had almost dictatorial rule. I don't know why I say almost. He had dictatorial rule over them. And New Netherland was the only foreign power he really had to deal with. Whereas Stuyvesant still had a lot of Native American unrest left over from Kieft. He had to deal with all of the New England colonies. He had to deal with New Sweden itself. He had to deal with his employers, the Dutch West India Company. He had to deal with the state's general. He had to deal with his own population, which we'll find out in the next episode, didn't like him very much. So while Johann Prince could focus on the one riverway, Stuyvesant had a lot of things going on. And Johann Prince knew that. And he knew, well, we're militarily weaker. We're fewer in number. We have less resources. We haven't heard from our employers in a very long time, but we're very single-minded here, whereas Stuyvesant has to be looking out in all these different directions. So they have a chance. Prince starts by controlling as much of the Delaware River as he can, contesting as much as he possibly can, and even blocking off tributaries to the best of his ability in order to frustrate the Dutch to the point that they might just leave. Prince most likely in his mind was thinking of the English who were encroaching on Long Island and trying to come into the Hudson Valley area and these other different parts of New Netherland that were at risk and the Native Americans right in the center of it whom they did not have good relations with. Prince was trying to frustrate Stuyvesant enough and New Netherland in general that it might not be worth it to keep control of the Delaware any portion of it therein. This strategy of Johann Prince involved building a lot of new forts. But Stuyvesant, he countered. And what he started to do was buy land from the Lene Lenape. He started buying land from the same people that the Swedes bought land from. And there were overlapping land claims now. Now both powers had deeds by Native American tribes saying they had control of various areas in the Delaware. So now Stuyvesant could say to Prince, well, you claim you own this area because you bought the land from the natives. We did the same thing. You claim the right of first settlement. Well, the Dutch had settlements there long before I came along, and we have settlements there right now. And you claim that you are trading on this river and you have forts here. Well, we do too. So Stuyvesant, in this bold move, manages to negate every argument Prince has as to why Sweden should have the claim to the riverway versus the Netherlands. Legally, they're about equal at this point. This infuriates Prince, and he starts buying up more land from the Lene Lenape and other Native American tribes also. Specifically, he wanted to buy land in between two chunks of Dutch claim land. And this way, break up the continuity of any Dutch claim that might be in place. So in addition to competition for the fur trade, this selling of land over and over again, sometimes overlapping plots, was a huge boon for the Native Americans. They're making bank at this time. But Prince was bold, and he took everything one step further. He went as far as raiding the Dutch settlements on the Delaware. Now, these are very specific raids. Had these been raids where they murdered and killed settlers, well, that would kind of be an act of war. And that's something Johann Prince, as a colonial governor within this great Swedish empire, probably doesn't have the power to do. And even if he does technically have the power to commence a war on such a level, it would bring Sweden's few resources needlessly to the Americas, which are already being ignored by the Swedish Empire. So he has to be careful. These are raids of deconstruction. So they would go in, they would burn fields. They would, any, any construction project going on at night, the Swedes would come in and deconstruct everything. And of course, they would take the nice hewn planks, which they needed so badly for their constructions. So the two powers are playing this kind of poker game, bluffing each other, but it's also a little bit like chicken. So they're, they're trying to see how close each other can come to all out war before one power backs off. And right now, Johann Prince is winning the game. So he's deconstructing these settlements. He's buying purchases in between Dutch purchases. He's maintaining New Sweden, despite the fact that there's no help coming from Sweden at this time. But Prince's actions were aggressive enough that Stuyvesant had enough of it. And he takes 120 men-at-arms and 11 ships 
and he is going to reinforce Fort Nassau on the Delaware. The 120 men come over land from New Amsterdam, and the 11 ships come down the coast and through the mouth of the Delaware River. This proved to be an impressive show of force, considering he brought down 150 men in 11 ships full of how, who knows how many men, and around the same time, Prince does a census of his colony, 79 men total. So although the two nations of the Netherlands and Sweden are at peace at this time, 79 men total. If Stuyvesant really wanted to make a move, he could. But there'd be an awful lot of diplomatic fallout from it. And he'd have to deal with that too. Stuyvesant then uses his new power on the Delaware to dismantle Fort Nassau. And a couple other forts. And he builds Fort Casimir. Casimir is going to be on the west side of the river, just like Fort Christina owned by the Swedes. It's a little further south, very close to Fort Christina, and a little further west because of the bend in the river. This location made it much easier for the Dutch to trade. It cut off all the ways the Swedes were trying to block trade to the Dutch between the Native Americans. And it was smack in the middle of the land claimed as New Sweden. So it was a huge middle finger in the face of Johann Prince saying, you don't control any of this. You're doing some trading on this river, but this is our territory. Once that's in place, Stuyvesant goes to these rural farming communities all along the Delaware, a mixture of Swedes, Finns, English, and Dutch. And he personally tries to convince them to pledge their allegiance to New Netherland and the Dutch. And before leaving the Delaware River to go back to New Amsterdam, he makes sure that the fort is strong enough and there are enough boats on the water to command the entire length of the riverway, bank to bank, east to west, essentially creating a toll booth. Now, remember, Fort Christina is further inland than Fort Casimir. So you have to go by Fort Casimir to get your stuff out to markets. And now the Dutch are stopping Swedish ships and charging them a toll based on how much they have in their boats, how many furs. They now have to pay a tax or a toll or an export tariff of sorts on goods that are going out of the Delaware River. Now, the resolve of these Dutch troops to potentially spark a war was tested by Johann Prince himself. Just like his predecessor, he went out on the river with a small boat and he played a game of essentially chicken, deadly chicken, with a Dutch warship that had cannons on it. And even though they fired warning shots over his head, Johann Prince, 400 pounds, in his little dinghy, sailed head to head with the Dutch ship and made his way past. So he essentially called their bluff. They were not willing to open fire. They weren't willing to start a conflict over the beaver trade on the Delaware. But of course, if you didn't have the bravery of Johann Prince, the Dutch could very easily extort a toll out of you. But the domestic problems for Johann Prince were starting to compile. He wasn't very popular with his colonists, neither was Stuyvesant with his own colonists, but there were very few colonists in New Sweden who was easier to deal with. But he had an issue of some of them fleeing to Maryland to seek a better life for themselves and to just avoid the despotic rule of Johann Prince. Furthermore, boats from Sweden were trying to get to New Sweden, but incidents kept occurring. Again, Sweden had a number of wars that pulled boats away, but even some of the boats that tried to make it there fell afoul with other powers in the colonial world. Stuyvesant, who tried everything he could to choke off and demoralize New Sweden and Johann Prince specifically, was able to inform Johann Prince that a Swedish ship headed towards the Americas had been captured by the Spanish. The captured Swedish ship that was taken by the Spanish, was first taken to Puerto Rico, where the governor there had them all converted forcibly to Catholicism. And then before those people were to depart Puerto Rico, the governor took one female with him, just took her, and I don't know what happened, no one knows what happened to her, I don't believe so. So one of the women were just taken by the governor. One group tried to escape the island, and they were successful, only to be captured now by the French, and imprisoned. All of their possessions many of which they tried to hide within their clothes and on their body, were taken from them. The women who would not give up the location of their secret possessions had their nails pulled out. Many of the men were tortured and killed by the French. Finally, the few remaining survivors of this doomed Swedish ship headed towards New Sweden were rescued by a couple Dutch sailors who were in port and said, you know what, we'll take these people off your hands. And those survivors, instead of having to now deal with the hardships of New Sweden, went right back to Sweden. In the entire existence of New Sweden, they see at most a dozen company ships come into their harbor. 
And so this was a huge loss for Johann Prince and the colony in general. Stuyvesant must have been waiting, just waiting for Johann Prince to give up. He's like, what else do I have to do to get you to just pack it in and leave? It's 1653. And if you haven't been keeping track, Johann Prince has now been in New Sweden nine years. And of those nine years, the last six, no word from the company, no word from Sweden, nothing. Now, if you remember, he was promised to only be there three years. That was the term of his rule. And that was the same for his predecessor. So he has served three times the amount of time he promised he would serve. And all of that extra time, he did it with zero help from Sweden proper. In this year, 1653, he counts 23 Dutch families allied with New Netherland living on the Delaware River. That's quite a lot for Johan Prince to deal with, considering scholars estimate that in 1653, the population of the entire New Sweden colony was only 200 people. In July of the very same year, 22 of those 200 colonists hand Prince a petition of grievances that they have signed. And they have a list of things they don't like that he's doing. One thing is that he always rules in his favor. So in any criminal or civil case of which he is the judge, jury, and ex executioner of the colony, it's always in his favor. It's always, it's always in the favor of those he likes anyway, no matter what the truth is. They also complain about how he has banned the use of natural resources in the land of New Sweden. All the natural resources are owned by the New Sweden Company. And so Johann Prince would not allow them to, again, trade in furs was probably the, the biggest one there. What else do they, does he have here? He personally did deals with the Dutch and the English for tobacco and fur. So, so the last complaint that I have written down here is that he is not following his own rules. He's not following the company rules. And he's dealing with enemies for his own personal gain. And that's 100% true, as we're going to see in a minute. How does Johann Prince respond to this list of grievances? He's cut off. He can't send back home for some sort of arbitration of any sort or any guidance. He is the, the man of nobility in the colony. And he's going to be the one to make a decision on this. He looks over the list of grievances. He finds out who's the ringleader of this. Who, who's leading this, what he would consider a mutiny. And he executes him for treason. Around this point, Prince had had enough. He was done. He had served his promised time, and then some, and then some. But he has to exit the colony in such a way that it doesn't look like a retreat or a surrender on a personal level or on a colony-wide level. So he throws a big lavish party, a big going away party. He invites all the native chiefs. They have a, a huge, it's a, it's a banger. They have a huge banging party. And afterwards, the people at the party turned into a congregation and they went to church and they had service. They made a big deal out of this. He then puts his son-in-law in charge of the colony. One of his daughters married another member of minor nobility who happened to be in the colony. He puts that guy in charge, and his daughter stays in the colony with him. So this way, when he goes back to New Sweden, and if there's any accusation, oh, you abandoned your post, you abandoned the colony, he's, no, 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 no. I served my term, and then some, and then some. And I've got no word from you, and I even left my son-in-law and my daughter at the colony. I clearly didn't abandon it. I, I did the best I could for it. But the question is now, how is he going to get back to Sweden? Again, they can barely make boards in New Sweden. How are they going to make a seafaring ship? Well, Johan Prince is going to have to go to New Amsterdam and ask Peter Stuyvesant, his arch nemesis, for a ride back home. The game was over. Stuyvesant had won. Prince had had enough. And he was going to go home. And Stuyvesant was probably elated to see that he made it home. I imagine when Johan Prince showed up in New Amsterdam, they rolled out a red carpet for him. Sure, come on, yeah, we'll get you home, no problem. To make matters even better for Stuyvesant, Prince is going home. He's taking his wife, he's taking four daughters, and he's taking 25 other colonists from the colony, of which there's only about 200, 300 at the most by the end of the colony's existence, back to Sweden. Now, before Prince left New Sweden, he said to the people who remain there, I will be back. But I'm willing to bet that Stuyvesant could see in his eyes and hear in his words that Johann Prince wasn't coming back. When he showed up in the colony, he was already 50 years old. Now you have this man who's just been worn down by years of hacking it out in his little tiny colony with no contact with the outside world. This guy is done. This must have been one of the best days of Stuyvesant's life. 
Of course, since his transportation back to Sweden was a Dutch transport, they stopped off in Amsterdam, where Johan Prince sold a large number of beaver furs, and the money from those beaver furs were credited to his personal account. Now, we've already established that all the fur trading in the colony has to go through the company. That's the company's money right there. Johan Prince knowingly broke the rules, cashed in, gave himself a good payday, and he probably felt like he deserved it. Again, he was there three times as long as he was supposed to be. So when he gets back to Sweden, there's no evidence he ever got in trouble for this. And in fact, he becomes a governor. The rest of his life, he becomes a, a Swedish governor. And he maintains his title of nobility. Stuyvesant probably sat back in Fort Amsterdam and thought to himself, well, who's the next guy going to be? Who am I going to go up against next? Or will there be another guy? Will the colony just fall apart on its own? Could I go in there? Could I take it right now? when they're between leadership. And our next episode will be on New Netherland, and we'll meet this character, Stuyvesant. He won't be the antagonist of our story, but he'll be the protagonist in our continuation of our narrative on New Netherland. So if you like this podcast, please give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or iTunes. And if you don't like this podcast, what you can do, if you want to give it anything less than a five-star review, you write down your review on a little tiny piece of paper. Then you roll it up real tight. This has been the Other States of America History Podcast. I'm Eric Giannis. Thank you for listening.